Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the intercostal muscles, which are a set of muscles, three of them, that lie between adjacent ribs, as you can see right here. Okay. So before we dive into the details on the intercostal muscles, I want to look at this picture, which we're going to look at again in another video in more detail. But notice here we have two ribs that are shown. Here's two ribs. And notice that they attach posteriorly to the vertebra, thoracic vertebra that is, and anteriorly to some part of the sternum. And yes, there are some ribs that don't attach to the sternum at all, and some that attach more indirectly via the costal cartilage of rib seven. However, we can get an appreciation here for the space that lies between two adjacent ribs. So if we look at this space that lies between these two ribs, this would be termed an intercostal space. Okay, now this would be where rib one attaches to the manubrium. This would be rib two, three, and so that makes this rib four, and that makes this rib five. And so we would actually call this the fourth intercostal space. That's because the space between rib one and rib two would be the first intercostal space. The space between ribs two and three would be the second, third, and then this space is going to be the fourth. Okay. And it's not actually a space necessarily because there's a lot of stuff in here that fills the space. And one of the major things are the intercostal muscles. Okay, so let's take a look at this diagram right here. So here we have two ribs. We don't know which ones they are, but again, we have three muscles here. The most superficial of all of these muscles is going to be the external intercostals or external intercostal muscles. And if you look at the fibers of these muscles, as you go inferiorly, the fibers seem to move medially. But what's more notable and more important is actually as you go down, as the fibers go inferiorly, they actually move more anteriorly. Okay, so that means that the attachment point on the rib below is actually more anterior than the attachment point on the rib above. Okay, and we'll talk about this external intercostal membrane later on in this video. When we talk about the external intercostals, we say the origin of the muscle is the rib above. So it's really the inferior border of the rib above. The insertion of the external intercostals will be the rib below, that is the superior border of the rib below. So origin on top, insertion below. And so if we think about the action of muscles where the insertion is pulled toward the origin, if the insertion is the rib below, then if this muscle were to contract, it would pull this rib upward toward the rib above. And since every one of the intercostal spaces has this muscle, if the external intercostals collectively contract, then what we would see is that all the ribs kind of move upward. So when you breathe in, the external intercostal muscles contract and that helps expand the rib cage so that you, the lungs can expand more and you can pull in more air. Now, when we're talking about quiet inhalation or passive inhalation, which is what you're probably doing right now when you breathe in, there are two major muscles at play. By far, the muscle that contributes the most to inhalation is the thoracic diaphragm, or just the diaphragm. But the external intercostals are also active during quiet or passive inhalation. And if we were to consider the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles, Batman and Robin, I would definitely say that the thoracic diaphragm is Batman, and then the external intercostals are Robin. If we move deep to the external intercostal muscles, we reach the middle layer, which is the internal intercostal muscles. Okay? So these are going to run obliquely at right angles to the external intercostal. So as we move inferiorly, we see the fibers tend to run more laterally. Okay? But another important thing is as you move inferiorly, the fibers actually move more posteriorly. Whereas for the external intercostals, as you went inferiorly, those fibers tended to move more anteriorly. Okay? Now, with the internal intercostals, they're going to have the opposite action as the external intercostals. So for the internal intercostals, their origin is actually the rib below. It's going to be the superior border of the rib below. And then the insertion of this muscle is going to be the rib above, but it's the inferior border of the rib above. And so again, if we consider that the insertion for an action of a muscle is pulled toward the origin, that means that this rib above is going to be pulled down 
toward the rib below. And if you consider the action of all 11 pairs of these muscles, the net effect is you have rib depression, or the ribs moving downward. And so that leads you to believe that the internal intercostals are going to be more important for exhalation. And that's what we see. Now, I will say this. When we're talking about quiet inhalation or passive inhalation, we are going to have contraction of the external intercostals. However, during quiet or passive exhalation, we generally do not see the internal intercostals contract. Usually these become more important when we start talking about active or forced exhalation. Okay? Um, normally for passive or quiet exhalation, that's simply due to the relaxation of the external intercostals and relaxation of the diaphragm. You don't actually need any active muscles to exhale passively. However, during active or forced exhalation or expiration, we do see the inter internal intercostals begin to contract. Okay? And before we go to the next slide, I just want to mention that these two muscles, external and internal intercostals, are supplied by the intercostal nerve, the intercostal artery, and vein. And those vessels and nerve are actually going to travel as well in this intercostal space as you can see right here. So for example, if we're talking about the fourth intercostal space right here, so these would be the fourth external intercostal and fourth internal intercostal, they would be supplied by the fourth intercostal artery, fourth intercostal vein, and fourth intercostal nerve. And those vessels and nerves we'll talk about in more detail in one of the next videos. Okay. So the innermost intercostal is the deepest of these three muscles. And what you should notice with this picture is notice that unlike the external and internal intercostals, which seem to actually be situated sort of between the two ribs, the innermost intercostal is actually situated more posteriorly behind both of these ribs. Okay? And so that's actually going to change its action a little bit than what we would expect. Okay, so when we talk about the innermost intercostal, its origin is actually going to be the rib above. Okay, its origin is the rib above, and it's going to be the posterior aspect of the inferior border of this rib. The insertion is the rib below, and it's going to be on the posterior aspect of the superior border of this rib below. Okay, now normally we would think of insertions being pulled toward origins, so this rib would actually be mo moving upward. However, due to the fact that these muscles actually attach on the posterior aspects of these ribs, it actually leads to more of a de net depression of the ribs, and so the innermost intercostals are going to be more or less synergistic with the internal intercostals, and so the innermost intercostals are going to aid in exhalation, so forced exhalation or active exhalation. Okay? And in a similar manner to the external and internal intercostals, the innermost intercostals are going to be supplied by the intercostal artery, vein, and nerve at that particular level in that particular intercostal space. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now what we want to do is actually get a feel for where the intercostal nerves and vessels actually run. So we're going to look at this picture right here. All right, so what we see here is this superficial muscle. This is our external intercostal muscle. Okay. If we were to peel away the external intercostal muscle like they have right here, the muscle directly deep to that is the internal intercostal muscle. However, if we look on the other side, on the posterior aspect of these ribs, that's where we find the innermost intercostal muscle. And it turns out that all these vessels and the nerve, the intercostal nerve in yellow, and the intercostal artery and vein, they actually run in the intercostal space between the innermost intercostal muscle and the internal intercostal muscle. Okay? So if you were to think about the order of a needle passing superficially through the external intercostal muscle, if you were poking it at the side at least, you would hit the external intercostal muscle the internal intercostal muscle, then you would pass through the area with these vessels right here and the nerve, and then finally you would pass through the innermost intercostal muscle. Over here, where we peel away this tissue right here, this peeled away tissue would have to be both the external and internal intercostal muscles because that allows us to see 
the intercostal artery and vein and the intercostal nerve at this level. And then the underlying muscle behind those, deep to those, would be the innermost intercostal muscle. So make sure you understand the order of these muscles with respect to the nerve and the vessels. The other thing to notice about where these vessels and the nerve are running is notice that they're actually near the top of the intercostal space. So if we look at this space between the innermost intercostal and the internal intercostal, they're sort of near the rib above. And that's because the rib above on its inferior surface has a groove called the costal groove. And we're gonna talk about this in more detail when we discuss the ribs, but if we actually break apart this rib like we have right here in this picture, there's actually a groove that runs most of the distance of the rib. And so if we follow these vessels and the nerve once they enter the intercostal space, they're pretty much going to run along that costal groove along the entire length of the rib. There are some other vessels and nerves that run along the bottom of the intercostal space, but these are not the true intercostal nerve and intercostal artery and vein. These are simply collateral branches that supply other structures. And the other thing that I wanted to mention before we conclude this video is that each of these muscles, external, internal, and innermost intercostals, are each associated with membranes. So when we look at this picture right here, it's not that the external intercostals are muscular along the entire length of the space, and the same is true of the internal and innermost intercostals. It turns out that each one of them is muscular only in a certain part and then more tendinous or membranous on another part. So if we consider the external intercostal muscles, they are muscular really in the posterior up until they get to a certain point anteriorly. And then in the most anterior portion, they have become the external intercostal membrane. Okay? The internal intercostals, for the most part, uh, anteriorly are going to be muscular, but then when they get to the posterior part, they're going to turn into the internal intercostal membrane. And then finally, the innermost intercostals, they're going to be muscular in the middle three quarters of the intercostal space, and then on both the anterior and posterior sides, they're going to become the innermost intercostal membranes. And to understand this, let's actually switch pictures. We're going to take a look at this picture right here, over on this side over here so that we can see those membranes. All right, so, all right, let's first of all find the three layers of muscles. All right, so first of all, the deepest one is the innermost intercostal muscle, the middle one is the internal intercostal muscle, and the superficial one is the external intercostal muscle. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna follow these muscles and see where they become more membranous. And the easiest one to really get this uh, concept with is the innermost intercostal muscle. That's the deepest one. So let's follow this muscle posteriorly. So we're going to go up here. We're going to follow this muscle along its length. And notice right here, it turns into this white structure, which would actually be the posterior innermost intercostal membrane. Okay. Now if we go back here and follow this muscle anteriorly, so follow it along here, we see that it also becomes more membranous anteriorly. This would actually be the anterior innermost intercostal membrane. So when we talk about the innermost intercostal, remember that its muscular part only occupies the middle three quarters of the intercostal space. On either side of that, it's membranous. Okay? Now let's take a look at the external intercostal. Okay? So this muscle, let's zoom in. That's actually this muscle right here. Now, if we follow this muscle anteriorly, we see that anteriorly it actually becomes more membranous. And that's because the external intercostal is really membranous in its anterior portion, and then at some point, right around the angle of the rib, it really just becomes muscular the entire length around posteriorly. If we look at the innermost intercostal, this one's going to follow the opposite pattern. In fact, if we go anteriorly along the internal intercostal, we see that all of it's muscular anteriorly, which must mean that the internal intercostal muscle must be posteriorly membranous. In fact, if we follow this around the posterior side, we see that the muscular part seems to terminate back here. And we can't really see so much of the, the membranous part of it, but it would continue back here. Okay, and actually become continuous with that of the innermost intercostal membrane back here.
Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully that gives you a good understanding of the intercostal muscles and the intercostal spaces. In the next few videos, we're going to be looking in more detail at the blood supply in the intercostal spaces and then also the nerve supply. And then after that, we'll discuss some of the muscles of the thoracic wall that we haven't seen yet. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.